Uh, welcome everybody um, to our second uh, plant health analysis workshop. Uh, we went over time in the first one, we'll probably go over time in the second one as well, that I can guarantee. Um, have your coffee at the ready, it's going to go pretty in depth this one. So we're joined today, we've got Penny Hundleby uh, from John Innes Centre, um, we've got Joel Williams and we've got Ben Taylor Davies. So uh, it's going to be pretty fast paced and pretty intense, so have the notepad at the ready. Um, what we're planning to do is roughly we're going to have three presentations quite quickly, quite hard hitting. Moving to the next slide. Uh, oh, yeah. Basis. So what we're saying on this chat, because it's an open one, um, don't put your name in, in the uh, chat function and your details. There's a link there to email us with your with your personal details and we'll submit that through to Basis uh, and in Rosso for your points. So again, don't put it in the chat function because that's open to everyone. Just email us, which Chris or Fiona will pop that in the link. Um, so our format, we're going to kick off with Penny just in a second here, and then we're going to move to Ben uh, and then on to Joel, and then we'll hopefully go into these breakout sessions where we'll really get into uh, uh, a lot more depth in the conversation, and then we'll pull it back together um, and try and close around 12.30ish. Um, which might elongate a little bit. Um, so, again, the Strategic Cereal Farm Summer, um, we've got quite a lot going on there. We've got David Miller, um, we've got Brian Barker, and we've got Dave Aglin and Rob Fox that are four strategic farmers, uh, and you'll see bits and pieces coming out from them um, over the next two or three weeks. Uh, so we've kicking this off. Um, we had last week with the research updates, which are online now. They're available on YouTube. Um, and then we've got this series of how-to workshops, um, which create a lot of questions for everybody to try and answer. Um, and we've had the first one this morning, which went quite well. And this one, I'm sure, will be a, a lot of information um, coming out quite quick. And then next week, uh, the flower and strip um, on Bull Burnie, which they've been doing quite a lot of work on. Lorna's joining in that one. Uh, and then trying to figure out your marginal land, um, which we did have quite a good discussion about this morning as well, anecdotally. So. Um, we'll move on uh, to, to Penny for a start there, um, who's joining us from the John, in John Innes Centre, um, which, again, a fantastic presentation, which is, is just mind-blowing. So we'll, we'll hand over to, to Penny for a start here. So um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, genome editing or gene editing uh, in plants in the context of plant breeding. Um, and you may have heard this referred to as CRISPR, and CRISPR is really the breakthrough technology of the decade. Um, so it won its inventors the Nobel Prize for Chemistry uh, last year. Um, and it, what it allows us to do in a nutshell is to, um, to remove or edit the existing DNA in a plant. So in that way, it's very different to GM technology that you may have heard of. That said, we can also use genome editing to introduce or replace a uh, genetic sequence. And therefore, it could be considered the upgrade to GM technology that you would have heard of. Um, before I go into too much detail, I just want to explain what I mean by genetic sequence. So our DNA contains all the information needed to build and maintain us. And if we were to unravel our DNA, we can see it's made up of these bases. So these A's, C's, T's and G's, so the building blocks. And so this is what I mean by genetic sequence. Um, so you would have heard in the news quite a lot about um, new COVID variants. And so this is by comparing the different sequences of those, we can see the changes that occur. So how does this compare to conventional uh, breeding? And then we'll talk a little bit about the regulatory status. So, um, oops, not letting me go across. so plant breeding is all about selecting for genetic variation. So that's mutations or changes in the genetic sequence that we see. So if, for example, we look at Brassica oleracea, so these are all related to this wild type that you see in the middle. So their genetic sequence will be very similar but mutations that have occurred to that genetic sequence over time have given rise to different traits. So changes in those letters. So for example, a mutation in that wild type that would have given rise to bigger leaves has been bred for over the years to give us kale. Mutations that give rise to denser flower bud formation have given us broccoli. And it's really important to note that those um, uh, mutations that we've selected for have been to meet our needs and not the needs of the plants. So these plants are now very much reliant on uh, human inputs for their survival. So whereas that wild type will happily grow in the in the hedgerows, you won't go out foraging for wild um, broccoli. Now in the 1940s, mutation breeding came along. So this was a way of inducing genetic variation. Um, so we would expose seed to chemical or radiation. 
And what this does is this causes damage to the DNA. So we can either lose genetic sequence or it causes um, tens of thousands of breaks uh, into the gene, uh, DNA. And then the plant will then try to repair itself. And in trying to uh, repair that break, it can either um, lose some of those bases or it can recruit the wrong letters. And therefore we introduce a point mutation. Um, so a breeder would then need to grow out that whole population, look for desirable traits, um, and then uh, it relies on uh, various crossbreeding to get rid of the undesired mutations, which I can explain a bit more in this slide. So breeding very much relies on plants being sexually compatible. So if we wanted to introduce a disease resistance gene from a wild type and cross it into an elite variety, as well as introducing the gene that we do want, we're also introducing tens of thousands of genes that we don't want because we inherit half of our DNA from each of our parents. So what we would then need to do is back cross over several generations to the elite line in order to remove the genes that we don't want. Now, technology that uh, came into play in the 1980s, so GM technology, so that allowed us for the first time to be able to clone just the gene that we want and introduce that back into our elite varieties. Um, and because the building blocks of uh, genes, so these A's, T's, C's and G's, are universal across species, it also meant that we could introduce genes from non-sexually compatible plants as well, but also other species. So most of the uh, GM plants that are out there at the moment, uh, herbicide tolerance and insect resistance, so these contain genes from bacteria uh, into plants. And this has been part of the controversy because I think it just doesn't sit well with people's uh, beliefs as to what is natural or not. Now, I want to give you an example of GM technology. So here we've got a potato uh, trial that was carried out in Norwich. Um, and what we've done here is uh, we've actually taken genes from wild uh, potatoes that confer resistance to late potato blight and introduced them into uh, elite varieties. So in the background, it's either Desire or, or Maris Piper, I'm not sure. Um, but you can clearly see the genes, uh, so the ones that have got resistance to mildew and the non-GM ones which have been completely decimated. So here this is a real example of where um, we can have genetic solutions to reduce our um, chemical inputs. Now obviously this is uh, GM, so in the UK, uh, our UK farmers can't grow this, but your US counterparts, for example, are growing it. But genome editing would allow us uh, in the future to be able to get to the same end point by editing uh, the plant's existing uh, DNA. So, so this then brings me on to uh, genome editing. And I, I think that um, I want you to think of this as the era of precision breeding. So whereas mutation breeding, we're introducing tens of thousands of random mutations, with genome editing, what it allows us to do is make targeted breaks uh, in our DNA, and then the plant would then repair itself in exactly the same way that I've uh, described before, and introducing a mutation. So we can create variation that way. Or we can use genome editing, as I said, to open up the genome at a precise location um, and remove genetic sequence or introduce new genetic sequence. So in that case, that would be considered an upgrade to GM technology. So are you guys likely to see genome edited crops uh, growing out in the future? Um, and there's a bit of a, a question mark on that at the moment. So for the rest, so most of the world, those countries that we can see in green, um, they are choosing to use genome editing where we've edited the existing uh, plant's DNA. So they're considering that to be an extension to conventional plant breeding. And so that's been given the, the go ahead. So these countries are already um, uh, gearing up to have genome edited crops out in the field. Uh, and those in red uh, at the moment consider it uh, to be GM. And that's partly because the technology has developed far quicker than the regulations have been able to um, catch up with. So these are currently being uh, debated at the moment. And uh, you know, Brexit obviously gives us the uh, opportunity to make our own decisions with how we view that. So currently DEFRA is um, undergoing a consultation exercise and we're expecting an announcement from DEFRA very soon on how it views this technology. So that's really in a nutshell what I'm going to talk about today. So for those of you who joined me in the breakout room, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about the science behind CRISPR 
Um, and then I'm going to give you a couple of applications of the technology. So I've um, managed to find some rust resistance uh, uh, um, examples to show you as well. And then I'll talk a little bit more in depth about the EU and UK position um, and what it means for us if we decide to go a different way to the rest of Europe. And as I say, DEFRA is expected to make a statement by next week on this. Uh, those of you who aren't coming to the breakout session who are interested in finding out more, um, I do tend to sort of tweet about this on social media, so you're very welcome to connecting with me. And uh, I will stop at that timely point and hand over to Chris. Well done, Penny. Thanks very much for that. And yeah, really, really interesting um, on the potato blight trial as well. I think there's going to be a few questions uh, come into our breakout session um, on that, without a doubt. So I, I think um, from memory, Christian, keep me right. Are we going to Joel next? Was that right? Yeah, Joel's coming next uh, with his presentation and then we'll finish up with Ben just so the two don't overlap too much. OK, so we'll hand over to Joel. OK, thank you very much. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, OK, so OK, uh, so we're going to there is a one a handful of slides. I'm not sure how much overlap we have between the last um, group and this one, but there's a couple of slides I'm just going to show again and we'll go and expand for this session i'm going to um, talk a little much more detail on the role of nutrition how nutrition can play a role um, in terms of um, optimizing uh, improving plant immunity so we're going to dive deeper into that specific part of the, the discussion around plant health so um, i did show this slide already last time so this was you know the, the fundamental idea of thinking about plant growth um, it all comes down to photosynthesis um, everything that the plant does, be that grow its biomass, its roots, its shoots, be that produce uh, flowers or grains or produce high protein or whatever, you name it, um, everything that the plant does ultimately stems from photosynthesis. And, you know, the very first part of that process is, is taking in that carbon dioxide and turning that into glucose, the very first product of photosynthesis. And, you know, there are certain minerals that then act as catalysts, also called enzymes, that, that help to convert or catalyze this process, um, building that, um, turning that carbon dioxide into the building block. And of course, certain minerals are really important for this. Chlorophyll is the site of photosynthesis, so magnesium, nitrogen are really important here, and iron in the synthesis of that chlorophyll. Um, manganese plays an important role in the splitting of water. You know, so there are certain minerals very directly um, related to that photosynthetic process. But then the plant will take that building block and again use minerals, uh, nut essential nutrients, all of the macro and micro minerals through other metabolic pathways. And it will turn that building block into a host of other plant compounds, um, taking that building block, turning it into more complex sugars and carbohydrates, linking in nitrogen or sulfur, building amino acids, building proteins, lipids, fats, waxes, re growth regulators, hormones, smells and scents, uh, and then a whole host of defense chemicals. Um, and that's the part we'll kind of particularly have a bit of a deeper exploration on. So again, this second step is dependent on those essential minerals, uh, the essential macro and micro minerals to facilitate uh, this ultimate conversion. So in a way, we could say that plant health comes down to, to this slide and the ability of the plant to grow itself, its biomass, but also to use essential nutrients to build certain protective uh, physical barriers and protective compounds, defense chemicals against um, pathogens. So, you know, we could spend hours going through this slide, but just, just to say that, of course, therefore, it, we do need a bit of a base understanding of plant nutrition and what some of the various functions, the roles and functions of the various essential nutrients are. And I, I won't dwell through this for, for brevity of time, but just to say that it, it is important to acknowledge the role of all of the macro minerals and all of the micro minerals, uh, all the way through to some of the more obscure ones that maybe aren't focused on quite so often nickel, cobalt, molybdenum, for example, you know, all very important, uh, equally important essential trace minerals. Now, just because a mineral is required in greater quantities, uh, some are required in greater quantities than others, it doesn't mean that any one of those can therefore impact for that photosynthetic process more or less. Um, so just to say that irrespective of the quantity of the nutrient required, macro versus micro, any one of a deficiency of any one of those can limit this photo, can have negative impacts and limit this photosynthetic potential. 
So um, then if we think about it, so I just want to emphasize that all of the minerals are important. Okay, It's not just about nitrogen or a handful of them. We need to factor in all of them. So extending that line of thinking, if we then think about the plant's own immune system, which I kind of really think is a really important part of what we might call plant health, it's just to say, here's that same slide. Again, we need the building block. And then the plant will use minerals as part of these um, enzyme through these enzyme systems to turn that building block into, okay, not flour, not protein, um, not carbohydrates, not other things, but also these defense chemicals. And so the plant can produce these very specific uh, bitter compounds, anti-herbivory, uh, anti-feedant type compounds, uh, cell strengtheners, uh, rough, um, building a more robust um, cell walls and skin of the plant, um, producing volatile compounds, attracting in insect beneficials or deterring pests, etc. Okay, so again, the plant requires nutrients to facilitate that process. And it's the same again with disease. Okay, we're just taking that building block. And once again, we require the minerals through metabolic pathways to synthesize antimicrobial, antibiotic type substances, um, and again, other protective compounds and defense chemicals against disease. So we're just bringing it back to this central role that nutrition also plays a part of, and it's not the only factor by any means. Um, you know, uh, as Penny kind of touched on, there's a whole underlying molecular and genetic kind of pieces of this puzzle as well. And um, as I also talked about in the last presentation, it's also about how we manage the wider agroecosystem and the environment in which we introduce plants into. But we're going to just obviously dive deeper that here we're going to discuss the, the role of those minerals in catalyzing those defense processes. So the plant ultimately has two defense mechanisms, passive and active. The idea of a passive um, defense is simply referring to more of those physical barriers. Uh, it could be spines and thorns and things like that, but ultimately it's particularly the thickness of the epidermis and also the reinforcement of the cell walls. So certain minerals are really important to catalyze these compounds. Manganese, boron, copper, really important here. Calcium, boron, silicon, really important in the cell walls. So the, the, the more we optimize the thickness of that skin of the plant, the more robust that barrier is in preventing um, insects or um, disease to penetrate. But then also internally, we have our active defenses, and these are more of those um, very active uh, bio compounds um, that often are then um, translocated systemically throughout the plant. Uh, these can be those antifungal or antibiotic or bitter type compounds, um, these specific biochemicals that um, the plant can uh, produce to um, uh, deter those pests. And uh, again, it's typically these um, compounds are typically turned on when the plant is under attack from a pathogen or an insect. Uh, the plant will change its root exudation patterns. It will recruit beneficial microbes and it will use those to then mount its defenses and produce uh, these various protective chemicals in return. And so this is just a selection of studies just to show some examples that there is a lot of work if we look into the literature on the links between nutrition and pest pressure, be that insect or disease. There's actually a really significant body of evidence and studies that have looked into this. And there's a lot of strong correlations with this. Now, it's not to say that all of these studies were successful in controlling and managing disease or insects with nutrition. It's not to say they were all successful by any means, but the evidence is very clear that in many instances, uh, it, they, it can be, uh, nutrition can indeed control, but you know, also more so perhaps I think the way we should focus on it as, is as part of an integrated system. Nutrition can indeed support uh, the immune processes. It can be one tool in the toolbox um, as part of an integrated strategy along with other strategies. Um, but I just really want to emphasize that this is not a kind of new or alternative idea that we can manage plant health and, and disease with nutrition. There is a really good body of published studies uh, looking into this. And admittedly, yes, there's knowledge gaps. Uh, we've got a lot to learn, but the potential is undoubtedly there. And I would argue that, you know, the it's all about the research agenda. If we want to find nutritional answers to these problems, we've got to prioritize that as our research agenda and invest in the research to kind of answer, you know, uh, and fill in some of these kind of knowledge gaps. And here's just one kind of really interesting example on this. This is a foliar applying manganese to cucumber to help manage disease. And this is just a really interesting study because I'll just read out these couple of key points. 
um, manganese has been shown to be very important uh, to prevent fungal diseases, but this depends on application time. So having adequate levels of manganese in, in the cucumbers led to a significant reduction in fungal disease. The highest reduction in disease severity was observed when manganese solutions were applied at four days before infection. So they intentionally infected the plants with disease, but prior to that, they applied these manganese treatments, manganese foliars at four days before the infection, uh, then seven days before, 10 days and 14 days. Okay, and so they found that the cucumber plants treated with manganese at four days before infection accumulated the highest levels of manganese and therefore led to the greatest level of disease suppression. Okay, so here's a really nice example bringing in this element of time. If we did this study and we just were applying manganese 14 and 10 days prior, you know, the outcome of the study would say, well, no, manganese wasn't effective. We didn't control that disease. Um, and it's bringing in that texture, this context here is that actually the timing of that input, uh, the form of the nutrient, the timing of that nutrient can be very important variables that influence the success of a, of a nutritional approach in achieving those desired nutrient outcomes. And so I think, again, a really good example of where there may be knowledge gaps um, and where we may be able to, to make some really significant gains uh, with a more fine-tuned approach. So just in kind of summary, just some of the key nutrients that are particularly important with resistance. Um, if we're talking about uh, cell strength and reinforcing the cell walls, calcium, silicon, and boron, those three minerals, they're all deposited in the cell walls. And plenty of good studies show that the more of those minerals we have in the cell walls, the tougher, uh, the more robust they are, making it uh, more difficult for both pathogen and insect to, to penetrate. Um, I mentioned earlier those other structural compounds, the lignin, uh, the, the cellulose, these kinds of other um, structural compounds. Uh, these trace minerals are particularly important for those, manganese, copper, and again, boron. So those uh, top um, minerals are really important for that whole idea of the skin of the plant. And if we move into some of the more internal uh, systemic compound uh, processes, then nutrients like silicon, manganese, and to be fair, probably copper should, copper should be on this list too. They all have a role in the synthesis of more of these defense chemicals, these internal uh, systemic uh, defense chemicals. So, um, you know, all of those nutrients then particularly important. And the other one is nitrogen um, and an imbalance of nitrogen. Uh, we often talk about having too much nitrogen in the system and too much nitrogen can induce, yes, it drives yield, but can also induce greater disease pressure. And that is valid. But there's more nuance to that discussion is to say it's an imbalance of nitrogen. Um, it's, it's having too much nitrogen in relation to the other minerals that support nitrogen metabolism, like sulfur, like molybdenum, et cetera. And I'm, I'm going to give a, an example of this. So um, this was a slide from a, a, a presentation. You can find this I've referenced it down the bottom if you punch that into, into Google. Um, this was just looking at uh, a review of some of the studies that link high nitrogen, uh, excess nitrogen in the plant to both insect and disease um, prevalence. Again, so there's a bunch of um, studies referenced here that you can see that show uh, under higher nitrogen enrichment, um, indeed this can lead to greater both pest and disease pressure. I would encourage you to, to look at that one um, when medicine feeds the problem. You'll find that one on, on YouTube. So, you know, there's this problem with, with nitrogen, excess nitrogen. We use nitrogen to drive production. It does come, it's a trade-off. It does come with a, with a cost. You know, um, I, we had some pre-discussions on today's um, session and uh, I hear this year yellow rust has been a big problem up north. I did a quick search into the literature on this. It wasn't a great deal on nutritional links and yellow rust, but I did find this paper from the Netherlands from 1995, looking at um, nitrogen, highlighting a suggestion that nitrogen uh, may be a factor here. So uh, two year trial, zero to 80 kgs of nitrogen the first year, and then the second year it was zero, 30 and 90. Uh, it was calcium ammonium nitrate that they applied. And in both years, the disease severity uh, increased strongly with increasing nitrogen levels. Okay, so that was indeed, they looked at a whole bunch of different um, varieties uh, in that influence. And it certainly it, it appeared the dominant factor was increasing levels of nitrogen did lead to increasing levels of yellow rust. So maybe there's a factor there in relation to what we're seeing 
this year in Scotland. And I just want to bring that context. It's not just about having excess nitrogen or too much nitrogen. It's about having imbalanced nitrogen. It's about not the problem arises when we don't have the other minerals that support nitrogen metabolism. And this slide is summarizing this point. When the plants take up nitrate nitrogen, they need molybdenum, sulfur, and iron to first, ultimately, there's a few metabolic steps here, but to convert this nitrate into um, ammonia and ammonium. Um, if the plants are taking up urea, they need nickel to help the conversion of that nickel, which also gets converted into ammonia and then quickly ammonium. And then the plant requires manganese and magnesium to convert ammonium into uh, one of the amino acids, the first amino acid, and from there uh, into a bunch of other amino acids. And from there, the plant wants proteins at the end of the day. It doesn't, the plant doesn't want nitrate. It doesn't want urea. It doesn't want ammonium. It doesn't necessarily want amino acids. It wants complete and complex proteins. And so a handful of other minerals that also play a role, particularly fos here, sulfur, magnesium, manganese, and boron. So the point is to say that uh, it's not necessarily just that we have too much nitrogen in the system. We may be missing these mineral catalysts that help the conversion, the metabolism of that nitrogen ultimately into the desired form. And it is the, the complete and complex proteins that um, then support more of those immune processes that we were talking about um, earlier. Okay, so then just a uh, little for closing slides here. This then emphasizes the importance of the role of plant nutrition and the importance of monitoring and managing plant nutrition. And here's just an example of some SAP tests. Uh, just to give an example, we can leave this discussion on into the workshop um, and have more of these conversations. Um, I, I, we could use a tissue test for this. I, I support the use of tissue tests, but obviously there's a lot of interest in the role of SAP tests in recent um, times, which I think is also very valid and good. Um, one of the very um, particularly beneficial things that come from the SAP analysis approach is this idea of testing both the young and old leaves. And this really taps us, helps us tap into more of the nuance around the nutrient mobility um, throughout the plant rather than just sampling the youngest mature fully formed leaf. Um, it's also combine that with an old leaf sample, we can tap into some of the nuance about nutrient mobility. And so here's an example. You know, we could look at this um, uh, chart here and um, generally, we can see this general trend that, okay, some of the major cations are quite high, magnesium, sodium, ammonium in this example. And as we all know, the, all of the major cation, cations are antagonists of each other. They're a bit like a seesaw. Some go up, the others go down. They, they have that antagonistic effect. So with this high dominance of some of these cations here, we're seeing this bit of a trend that calcium and potassium, for example, maybe are suffering accordingly due to maybe this, particularly this very high sodium is, is likely a bit, very high candidate. So, so yes, we can look at the general relationship between uh, minerals like we would do with a traditional analysis. But if we then just go like a little deeper, let's use this example, we're also picking up this nuance between the young and the old leaves. Okay, so let's use an example of potassium what we're seeing here is that the younger leaves uh, at more at the growing closer to the growing tips you can see that we have perhaps a little high but certainly adequate potassium in those young leaves in the tips but if we look at the older leaves we can see that those older leaves are indeed much lower in potassium and bordering on a potassium deficiency so we've tapped into this fact that okay potassium is a very mobile mineral so it has taken the potassium the plant has taken the potassium from those older leaves and sent it to the new growth areas, which are you know, more photosynthetically active, you know, more important, closer to the sun, et cetera. And as potassium departs those older leaves to go to the new leaves, um, we are inducing a potassium deficiency in the older leaves. And as you're all aware, where does disease often come into first? We will often see diseases coming in on those older leaves, which um, may then be potassium deficient. Equally with calcium, calcium, on the other hand, is a highly immobile element in the plant. So it doesn't move from the older leaves to the new growth areas quite so easily, or if, if at all. Um, once it's embedded in the plant, it becomes structurally part of those cell walls and is not able to be remobilized. So you can see here that calcium in the older leaves, which is giving us a view back into the past, 
Historically, calcium was at an adequate level, but if we look at the new growth areas, look at the younger leaves, we can see that now calcium is bordering on also being, okay, just okay, but potentially bordering on being marginal there, so in those younger leaves. So this is now signaling to us that historically calcium was okay, um, but now we have a, a, an immediate issue, a potential issue on the horizon. Um, and so this is, again, just one of these examples of this nuance between young and old leaves. And one other example to close, um, I touched on this example about nitrate um, and the various forms of nitrogen, this imbalanced nitrogen. You can see here we have very high levels of nitrate here. Um, and so it's, we, if we were looking at a traditional tissue analysis and just looking at total nitrogen, it's not breaking down what form that nitrogen is. It is in the ammonium form, the nitrate form in the organic form, uh, we're not getting tapping into that kind of nuance. So here we're breaking down the total nitrogen into its um, components, the ammonium and the nitrate. And we can see that nitrate is high. So what were some of those minerals that helped to convert nitrate on that graph that I, that little flow chart I showed earlier? It was moly, it was sulfur, and it was iron. They were the three that helped to convert nitrate into ammonium. So if we have a look at sulfur, we can see that we have a sulfur deficiency, and again, particularly a sulfur deficiency in the younger leaves, sulfur also an immobile nutrient like calcium. You can see that iron is also low across the board, and you can see that molybdenum is particularly low across the board. So the three key minerals, sulfur, moly, and iron, that convert that nitrate um, are all low, um, hence explaining the high nitrate. We also see that boron is also low, and boron also plays a role here more indirectly, where boron um, is uh, low boron has been associated with low activity of that nitrate reductase enzyme, the special enzyme that helps to convert that nitrate. There seems to be a link here with boron where low boron correlates with low activity of that, that enzyme that makes that conversion. So we have four of the other synergistic nutrients, those other supporting minerals that work with nitrogen to help nitrogen do its job. Uh, those other four minerals are all lacking uh, as, and as we see leading to high nitrates and that's going to be leading to an unhealthy imbalanced plant which then is going to be more prone to the insect and disease problems. Okay, thanks very much. Wow, thanks very much, Joel. Again, you know, a good follow-on from the from this morning's discussion, and it does just highlight, you know, to get this nitrogen right, doesn't it? You know, we've got seven, eight passes um, in in the spring, uh, where where we've got the opportunity to try and correct this instead of doing it in three hits. Um, so very interesting there there to hear um, of that. You know, one of the key things to work on for next year, which we're doing at Bull Burnley with David as well. Um, so we're next on to Ben Taylor-Davies. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ben, as well. It's been great catching up with you um, uh, to bring you to this stage as well. So uh, we'll, we'll hand over to you next before we go into our breakout rooms. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Let's start there. Yep. That's perfect. And can you see my screen? Yep. Excellent. Okay. Um, uh, so, so uh, yeah, the reason myself and Joel swap round um, is because I think Joel, Joel's put an awful lot of um, uh, meat on the bones in terms of sap analysis and, and um, nutrition. Um, and what I'm going to do is present pretty much um, using all of Joel's information and knowledge and actually um, in the UK, um, practical imp implementation of what uh, of, of those practices. Um, so, so. Um, I'm a farmer and I'm also advisor, so um, that, that that allows me to do um, a multitude of things, um, uh, uh, plenty of experiments, plenty of trials, uh, and also uh, implement across the UK, um, in actual fact, and part of Europe now as well. Um, so um, what I think is one of the major problems on regenerative agriculture is um, a lot of people start playing with cover crops. Um, uh, at the start, um, probably purchase new drills, direct drills, and all sorts of things, and, th and then get pretty much stuck um, of, of how to, to take the next steps to reduce fungicides, to reduce insecticides, to, to, to reduce herbicides even, have a look at um, um, certainly the reduction in, in nitrogen, but also um, potassium and phosphate. And... Um, and, and, and trying to maintain a yield um, that that, it, that is certainly realistic, rather than probably um, we're all 
guilty of uh, historically probably treating most wheat crops throughout the UK as if we can grow them at about 13 to 14 tonnes a hectare, where in quite reality, uh, it's the very good years we hit t- 10 to 9 hectare and in uh, some of the poor years, 7. So uh, I think um, there, there needs to be a um, certainly an acceptance of realism. So um, I was just going to talk you through basically um, my steps of how um, of how we've got to where we are in a crop of winter wheat uh, on my own farm. So I, I will just put, uh, uh, um, first and foremost, the only one thing worse than uh, no data, as far as I'm concerned, is, is poor data. Um, and um, there, there is plenty of poor data around. And I think um, you, cutting the wheat from the chaff and trying to understand exactly what um, the um, results showing you is is something that's absolutely critical going forward. And for that, I, I, I'm talking about comprehensive testing. Uh, I use uh, Ian Robertson, and I'm not ashamed to say this, of sustainable soil management for my soils. And the reason I use Ian is about seven years ago, um, I sent him the soil samples of my farm. Uh, He rang me, never met him, uh, and he told me pretty much about the way I farm, how I farm and how my soils acted. And that was the first time I've ever had anybody look at a piece of paper and tell me more about my farm than probably... Uh, anybody that's been walking it for years and years and years. So so it, it, I was pretty sold on that and I decided to pursue that for my own interests and my own clients um, because um, being able to understand how, how, how everything works, and that includes nutrition in the, what we call it, nutrition in the larder, nutrition on the kitchen table and nutrition on your plate. And it's very important to know exactly what you have in all three in order to manage a, a healthy crop. And then, um, um, uh, as Joel uh, showed you earlier, some Nova crop control um, sap analysis. Uh, I do do both. I do um, tissue analysis, which I think are important at the end of the season. That's when I do biomass weights and actually look at what the whole crop has taken up during the whole period of, uh, of growth. And from that, we can work out exactly what is in that crop. But in terms of snapshot through time, I think sap analysis is is is, is absolutely vital in understanding uh, the crop physiology, how it's working, um, what it's short of, but but more more importantly, um, two things uh, is managing excesses. Uh, we often only ever look at managing deficiencies, and I, I think managing excesses is far more important than managing um, deficiencies. Uh, interesting enough, Joel showed a couple of um, slides with nitrates of I think 8,000 ppm's uh, of, of of excess. Um, that 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 is that is a root cause problem, and and, and that crop will be severely open to yellow rust um, infection without a shadow of a doubt. One thing Joel um, did, didn't quite mention, I think it's quite important as well when you're looking at ammonium and, and nitrate in these sap analysis, is a, the optimum plant of, for where we're looking for them is almost zero on both ammonium and nitrate. So if if if, if plants are fairly unhealthy, they'll they'll be showing large amounts of ammonium and large amounts of nitrate. Nitrate is fairly straightforward in terms of trying to to reduce nitrate ammonium is slightly more tricky but it certainly can be done and be managed so so that's that's that, that's the first and foremost part of uh, of improving uh, people's knowledge of understanding crop health cover crops i think most people are growing them um but i think you need to get a little bit more accurate and and start understanding when you're planting your cover crop at, at what time of year as you can see in here we've got a mixture of c3s and c4s uh, I think we also um, always uh, expect uh, a seed mix to to grow in in the in the exact proportions in which you're planting them, and of course the whole point in, of adding diversity is that if one thing fails, then another thing more than likely will, will will take over. So, for instance, at the back end of August last year, it went actually quite cold and wet, and where we planted C4s, they failed. But fortunately, we put them in with a load of C3s, and the C3s took up that slack and, and, and grew really well. So diversity is something that's really, really important. Um, I put for soil and animal benefit. I mean, um, interesting enough, I, I farm on the Welsh border, and um, there's an awful lot of history of, of sheep farmers coming down on tack, um, grazing stubble turnips to pretty much mud. Um, and, um, and and the, and the sheep was receiving about 100% of everything we got, probably minus 10% of my soil health. What I look to do in terms of um, looking at uh, cover crops is is 70% for my sheep and uh, 70% for my soil. And I think 70 plus 70, 140% is a far better way 
and a far better idea than actually 100% for the sheep and minus 10% from the soil. And the other th the things to look at when considering cover crops is um, your soil type, obviously. I've mentioned diversity and, and the phenolic um, compounds. So uh, Dr. Caligari um, is, is, um, is is quite famed for, for mentioning his, uh, his uh, cover crop cocktail mixtures, and that includes grasses, um, cereals, brassica, legume, and of course, cleanopods as well. So if you can get those five things into any sort of mix, you, you certainly add the phenolic compounds that have been given off in the root zone. So, so all of a sudden the cover crop adds, adds more and more and more. Um, straw management. Um, interesting enough, I think a lot of people um, on the journey, the first thing they, they pretty much do is, is start spreading straw um, when nitrate or nitrogen levels in the soil that probably can't cope with it. And certainly the bacteria and, and, and uh, fungi are, are, are certainly lacking. And what you end up with is generally a carbon choke of an awful lot of carbon going into the soil and, and, and actually starting to have some quite serious issues with, with following crops. And one of the most important things to understand is actually uh, removal of straw at the start of the journey is, is often quite beneficial to, to actually uh, a very slow method of, of beginning this, this improvement in soil health. <laughs> Um, and of course, not all straws are the same either. You know, barley straw and oat straw, uh, I would certainly at the start of a process be removing at any, any stage anyway, because they take an awful lot more breaking down. Uh, wheat and legume, obviously, less so. And if you're going to spread um, your wheat straw, then consider planting some um, vetches and peas and, and any legumes that will start to offset that nitrogen carbon ratio and, and start to bring that right down. Uh, integration of livestock. So again, this is on my own farm. They're actually my own sheep up there. Uh, moved um, pretty much uh, every three or four days. Um, on the principle of that 70-70 rule, um, I, I, as you can see, there's quite a lot of uh, green material left. It's not grazed to the not grazed to the ground. Uh, they're quite a diverse cover crop, and um, they get across the ground quite quickly. And in terms of weed control in the spring, we basically let them back in and, and tidy up any any um, green material just, just pre-planting. You could tell me the dimensions of the small yellow sticky trap that you've got on your website, please. Somebody's not on mute. Sorry, we'll, we'll, I've sorted that out there. Um, yeah, no, sorry about that, Ben. No problem at all. Um, reduced tillage uh, to direct drilling. Um, I, th I think the most important thing and, and something we've done for probably the last 70 years is is reach for a piece of machinery, reach for a can, a bottle, a packet um, to solve our problems. And um, I think one of the most important things, and Jake Freestone um, hit, hit on this um, when he did a presentation for me about three or four years ago, was just make sure your soil is ready to take a direct drill. For goodness sake, um, you know, that, that drill there, well, I think was 135,000 pounds. And uh, fortunately, um, we, we'd spent four years preparing the soil and getting it ready and, 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 and away it went. But there are so many horror stories of people deciding one morning that they're going to become a biological farmer. And um, and as soon as they become this biological farmer, uh, the first thing they do is buy a new drill. And of course, um, if you haven't told your soil or certainly made your soil uh, ready for it, then um, then then um, get into some serious problems. And and one, one thing I think we've also got to be mindful of is, is becoming a militant direct driller. Um, and um, I, I would always say, you know, just because you have a direct drill, it doesn't mean to say it, it's the end of tillage. And the reason for that is, um, this is a fairly horrific photo, but it it, it just is a good photo and it shows what we've built in terms of low, low disturbance subsoilers, um, where we use a rip and drip system, uh, where we, where whenever we see compaction, and, and to be honest, um, what, we, what, what I do as a farmer and is therefore able to to explain and understand whilst we, we're always looking for leave, leave, leaving continuous living roots and we're always looking to do all the best practices and everything. Unfortunately, Mother Nature often often plays a part and we need to be reactive to Mother Nature. Either um, this was on a floodplain, got totally flooded in that um, storm, Dennis flood and, um, and, and and removed all green material. So uh, the, the soil slumped. It's a very, very high magnesium and very high silt. 
Um, so in actual fact, we, we, we had problems. We weren't going to undo the problems with, um, and it had a huge amount of weight of water on it as well. So we weren't going to undo the problems with, um, with roots because unfortunately roots are great whilst they can actually grow. But unfortunately, if they're in a, in a scenario where the, the soil is, is far too tight and bear in mind 50% of your soil should be water or air, i.e. not a lot, um, that there were some serious problems. And what we're doing here is, is actually um, pulling a low disturbance subsoil through the soil. And um, that's great. Um, the, the, the biggest problem with subsoiling is it allows a, a rush of oxygen into the soil, and that's a good thing too. But that wakes up an awful lot of um, soil biology. And the, the thing on this soil biology, it wakes up hungry. And there's an awful lot of it that's woken up hungry. And um, the first thing soil biology, of course, will always live on is the root exudates. Um, if it has no, obviously, root exudates, as you can see there, it lives on the dead roots because there are exudates still in the roots. Um, if it hasn't got any uh, root exudates, it looks at uh, surface trash. And as you can see, there's very little of that. And, and as a last resort to, to, to uh, remain alive, it starts eating organic matter, the very home it's living in, and the very thing you need in that soil in order to create uh, soil structure. So funnily enough, those that often use the subsoil are in that uh, perpetual motion of having to subsoil, um, uh, losing organic matter, having to subsoil again. What you can see here is a system where we're dripping uh, fish hydrolysate and some humic acid uh, down behind the legs. You can also see the microband on the back that's planting cover crop straight in. So the idea being we're giving the the, um, the bacteria and fungi, so they, uh, whilst we're, we're giving the humic and molasses to the bacteria, we're giving the fish hydrolysate for, for fungi. And while, whilst that is a temporary food source, the, it allows the roots to get going and, and, and uh, the roots then take over. So it's a small stop stopgap, but a very important stopgap at that. Um, compost, and, we, and, and again, I can probably talk about pretty much every one of these slides for, for an hour or more. Um, but compost, uh, unfortunately, has a, has a tragic um, meaning at the moment because it gets so confusing. And I think we need to really understand that there are two forms of compost. The one you're looking at there is past 100. And we call that, or I call that, or refer to it as an organic amendment and, and full of soil organic matter and, um, and nutrition. And then we also have to think of compost differently in terms of biological inoculant. The very things such as Johnson Sioux and those sort of things or, or, or static beams or anything where you are focused on actually breeding um, indigenous microorganisms in order to actually start kickstarting your system. Both have a huge place, uh, both either Bakashi or, or, um, or PAS100 uh, and, and, and biological inoculants, but they need to be used um, probably together and certainly comp complement each other in terms of what one's doing, the other can also help, help along, and we certainly use both. Um, and um, I think one of the most important things is, is to study both your soil, uh, but also the, the compost you're making and to make sure that in actual fact, you're you're applying what you think you're applying, and 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 the biggest problem in the in um, UK soils, probably world soils all over, is that lack of secondary consumers. Um, we have quite a lot of bacteria in soils. They're bacteria dominated um, because Mother Nature puts bacteria as the very first point of call of repairing herself, and she keeps getting destroyed, so bacteria keeps going in. Uh, the things we're missing is generally the protozoa, spring springtail nematode. And, and, and fungi, which is why we create uh, biological compost to, to, to try and kickstart that system. And that's why I use um, and, and started to use um, quite a lot this year of fish hydrolysate to try and feed A, protozoa, and B, um, the amount of fungi I'm seeing coming straight in on the back of that is, is quite incredible. And we're studying with the University of Sheffield at the moment exactly what that means for my soil biology. Um, I think these are getting more and more popular. We've been doing this now for, this is uh, the sixth season of understory of, of, of living mulch, um, learning all the times. Uh, I think it, it's one of these things that's vital in terms of when we're looking to, to reduce uh, herbicides essentially, but, but more importantly, nitrogen. But we've got to be careful and manage them in such a way that, it, that they don't start out competing or competing with whatever crop you're growing, such as wheat we've got here. So um, 
we're, we're learning an awful lot of lessons, but what we are finding is the health of the crop on a managed cl clover understory is far and away more healthy than a crop that doesn't have a, 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 a clover understory. Um, what else this gives as well, of course, as soon as you remove the, the wheat at the, at the end of the season, you have a, a permanent cover crop. So that takes sun's energy immediately, starts to grow really well, and you can either um, mow it and bale it or um, whole crop silage it or, or, or even graze, graze across it. Um, so we're finding some really good results with, 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 with clovers. We've got... It's not the easiest thing, if I'm absolutely honest, to establish, but we're, we're not quite sure why and how we're getting some fantastic results in some places and some really poor results in others. Um, but overall, I suspect we're up to about 350 hectares worth of understory clovers in, in various places and under very, various farms. Um, very pleasing with the results as well. We're certainly learning how to manage them uh, much better as well. Um, I, I think one of the most important things, uh, um, this was sent to me by a, a sprayer operator uh, only yesterday, um, is, is looking at diversity within within wheat. Uh, um, I, I should have thought most of you are quite familiar with Wakelin's YQ as a variety. Uh, I've made some of my own blends. And then what I've actually done is taken my own blend and mixed it with YQ and called it YQ+. Plus. So not only have we got 144 varieties of the YQ, but we've also got 16 varieties of my own, and they're all crossing and outcrossing and, 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 and doing everything that should. And as you can see, um, the X days, um, I'm sure people are nodding and, and, and more than familiar looking recommended list, yellow rust eight. What does that mean? Pretty much zero, because in actual fact, um, it's it's full of yellow rust. Why is it full of yellow rust? Well, when you look at the sap analysis, nitrate was off the scale because that was on a standard plot. And on the YQ on the right hand side, it's only had 30 kilos of nitrogen or applied foliar. Um, and interesting enough, not once has that YQ on the right hand side ever shown nitrogen deficiency being a limiting factor. We've had to use some molybdenum. We've had to use quite a lot of magnesium this year. We've seen huge magnesium deficiencies but never as nitrogen being the limiting factor this year. So that's quite quite an important, quite a, a, um, a, an obvious photograph of, of why, why we're moving forward. I thought I'd better put this in because being a farmer, I think it's quite important that we all talk about um, pretty pictures and things like that. But I, I also think it's quite important to look at um, profit because at the end of the day, I think we're all here to make money. Um, the interesting thing from, from this year, um, uh, and what I would say on my eight ton a hectare of, of regenerative wheat, what I've done is basically put the cost of the regenerative wheat on 30 kilos of nitrogen and, and the various bits and pieces I've added to the, to the thing. And that's no fungicides and uh, only one broadleaf herbicide and that sort of thing. And I've compared that to my standard trials where we've used 220 kilos of nitrogen, a standard um, herbicide program and a three spray fungicide program. And interesting enough, if you look at the ammonium nitrate price at £198 a tonne, I put all the other fixed costs in, the, uh, all the other variable costs in too. But interesting enough, this year is that whammy where, in actual fact, you could probably make more profit on, um, on a full ammonium nitrate program, full fungicide program. Uh, you need a response of 1.9 tonnes a hectare. So 10 tonne a hectare, probably more than possible this year when you drive around the countryside. There's some really good looking wheats out there. Uh, but I do think that's on a double whammy of cheap nitrogen back uh, back in June last year and wheat prices somewhere near £200 a tonne mark. What happens when we look forward? Well, I think um, nitrogen is looking at trading around 278 to 80 at the moment. Wheat prices is looking forward are £150 a tonne and all of a sudden I need 11 tonnes a hectare. And in, and I, on my own farm, 11 tonnes a hectare, we've never done 11 tonnes a hectare and, and we're never likely to do. And that's 11 tonnes on average. I am far more comfortable trying to hit my eight tonne uh, than I ever would be trying to hit 11. And of course, I'm trying to build soils and resilience and that sort of thing as well and actually give my, my, my children the opportunity of farming um, in, in the future and their children's children. And then, of course, you know, I just put in, you know, if ammonium nitrate goes up even more, it, it soon becomes impossible in terms of profitability. So that's a, a bit of a snapshot of, of what I'm doing um, um, back on my own farm. Um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll hand back over. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that with us, Ben. So, some interesting 
um, realizations in there, without a doubt. Uh, and thanks for the sensitivity analysis. That's that's great um, to share. I do I do like uh, your analogies there with the the low dis disturbance subsoil and your rip and drip. You know, if you're going to put that much effort into a pass, why wouldn't you apply something when you're doing it when you're going slow and intensive? So. Yeah, I mean, all, all the basics there are absolutely to be followed. And again, nitrogen, the big elephant in the room, we need to get on top of this without a doubt. We've just not got to the bottom of the science behind it here at all. Fantastic conversation. Uh, and, and we'll get to our facilitators to sum up. And I suppose um, Penny and I just getting into the in-depth of plant breeding and just it's the speed of it really that we, that we were discussing there in terms of you can take the traits uh, and put them straight in instead of going through the breeding uh, side of things where you nearly get what you want, but you're not quite sure of the outcome come until you do it and test it whereas now we can actually research it and then check the plant as it's grown to see that we've got the desired effect that we wanted and a lot of um, great discussion uh, in our group especially around the nutrient dense foods um, that we know we're heading for um, with a much reduced synthetic input and it's just trying to make sure that that market is there for us and ready for us um, I think was probably a, a quick summary from our room but uh, yeah fantastic we could have gone on for another half an hour um johnny have you how did you get on uh very well uh we had um uh, some uh, question about uh, veg in regenerative agricultural rotation um uh that ben grows uh, tatties one year and six uh, but he's doing he's doing them with no phosphate, no insecticides, no herbicides, uh, balanced nutrition. Um, he is um, using um, uh, a companion crop that he's planting with it. I think buckwheat, vetch and peas, if I've written down the notes, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and he's trying to have as much biology as possible in the soil. Uh, so that the tatties don't do as much damage as they would ordinarily do. He's also planting a C3, C4 mix immediately after they come out quite early season so that he can repair as much damage as possible. So it, it's uh, um, uh, that that was uh, certainly eye opening to me. Um, uh, we then had questions about straw management um, and it's about thinking about the carbon nitrogen ratio uh, that um, if you're just putting straw, just leaving the straw there, that you're probably going to have a, a carbon problem. Um, and think about either taking it away or adding um, uh, adding some urea to it, just so you're making the balance right. Uh, we had questions about uh, uh, sap analysis, um, and uh, Ben was talking about focusing on the excesses, not necessarily the deficiencies. That the excesses are uh, just as important as the deficiencies. Um, we then had a question about um, how you react to those sap analysis analyses and the um, uh, and the the excesses that are there. Uh, he was talking about he he goes through his wheat crop four times doing sap analysis in the spring uh, and there's an immediate reaction to it. Um, and um, that when you are putting stuff on, react to the amount of biomass that you've got in your crop, uh, because depending on how big it is, a certain um, uh, rate might not be appropriate. Uh, and then we were talking about his rotation as well, which is pretty flexible was the word that he used, but it does have tatties one year and six. Oh, fantastic. And definitely love that. It's not a potato. It's definitely a tatty. Remember that. That's where he joined <laughs> us. Um, David, on to you. Yeah, no, we had a good chat with Joel. Um, some questions uh, around fully application site of um, nutrition. Um, we started by looking at uh, you know, is, is the foliar application, is it a long term thing or is it we just kind of waiting for the soil biology to build um, as we go along this journey and in time we should be able to reduce all that. Um, obviously some of that will slightly depend on your soil type, um, heavier more bodied soils are going to carry far greater quantities of nutrition in them as light soils. Um, whether we ever get to the panacea of nothing uh, or utopia rather of um, no nutrition involved at all, we don't know, but we've started on the journey and we'll see how far we get. Um, 
another question, a very good one about looking at um, foliar urea um, and whether we'd consider work here regarding that on, with timings. Um, and very much the emphasis is on balancing the urea with the, with the plants, other needs to the, the slide that Joel showed of the, the process by which the urea is is transformed into the plant, ultimately into the proteins. Um, and if we keep an eye on that, then we should be able to make further progress and potentially make further reductions. Um, uh, there was a question regarding you know, if we lose urea, what are we going to do? Because essentially we'll be left with expensive amino acids from um, snake oil salesmen, potentially, or um, ammonium nitrate. And we kind of started to look at ammonium nitrate, thinking, well, nitrates in the plant are bad and you know, a terrible thing, and we're doing better with urea. But actually, Joel pointed out that nitrates aren't bad per se. They're maybe only bad because we don't apply them in a balanced form with the other minerals that are required to, um, to process them within the plant to, to get to where they need to be the amino acids and the protein. So again, it's just about looking at looking at balance along the route. Um, that seems to be the process that we, we need to remember. Whatever we're doing is, is balance everything, um, which is as an industry, perhaps what we haven't been educated to do for the last few decades. So yeah, fascinating stuff. Thanks, David. Uh, and fantastic. I mean, I look forward to actually watching this back because, you know, we probably wanted to hear what everybody was discussing in depth in the rooms as well. Um, so that, that's, a, you know, a brief tour of it today, uh, you, you know, and hopefully we've tried to do as much justice uh, in the time that we had available so we can at least get back to some farmer meetings. And I know Ben and Joel will both be down at Groundswell and Johnny's uh, going to join us on stage down there as well in our stand so we'll definitely all be uh, down at there for an arms for a beer or two um at that as well so uh look thanks very much to ben and to joel for getting up at 2 a.m and having a quick shower to to, to join us so uh that, that was absolutely fantastic good effort there uh, and a big thanks to the team at bulburney for making all this possible both johnny and dave uh, I mean, I know the sprayer driver must be absolutely exasperated at the amount of times he's been through our trials, but uh, we're starting to get the information and hopefully over the next uh, six years, we might come up with something fairly uh, impressive out of it. And these trials will change. It's a farmer led, farmer driven project. Um, so everything that's noted on these webinars will go into it going forward. Uh, and I think Emily definitely wins the award for the biggest sneeze I've ever heard during a presentation. So we do hope that your uh, dishes do arrive next week, but well done. Um, so, Luke, thanks very much, guys. We're just a wee bit over time. Um, and again, remember your basis and facts points. If you pop them in the, the, the chat, the email's there. So if you email them through, um, we'll, we'll get that sorted out for you. But uh, thanks to all involved. It's been a been an intense day and a lot of learning. So we're off for a bowl of soup and discuss it now as well. So uh, thanks very much, everyone, and we'll catch you soon.